So tonight's saint um, that we're going to talk about is one you may or may not have heard of before. Her name is Saint Catherine Drexel, and she's um, I mean she's not like kind of you know like a Saint Francis or Saint Anthony, you know, one that you hear a lot about, but she's an important saint um, for what we've been talking about here. You know, love and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. She had a really big devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and she's also um, like the second American-born person canonized a saint. So she's an American. She grew up in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area. And so um, so she's someone that's maybe close to home. The other thing is, is that she lived, you know, she lived, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. She died in 1955. So she's, she's someone, she's not like a saint who was like from 800 years ago that maybe we can't relate to or something like that. So... Um, in a nutshell, she was, uh, and you may have heard the name Drexel because there's like a Drexel University. It's a big name out in the Philadelphia area. The Drexels were, um, they were a family of bankers. And so her father, Francis, was, a, was an investment banker. And so he was pretty well off. Um, and he, uh, uh, he, he married a woman named Hannah. And uh, they had two children. The first one was uh, Elizabeth. First one's name was Elizabeth, and then two years later, um, Catherine was born. Um, the thing is, is that her mom did not survive the childbirth. About five weeks after Catherine was born, she died. So she just never really recovered from the childbirth. And so almost immediately, you know, so, so Catherine, you know, her mom was dead by the time she was five weeks old. And so what, you know, her father uh, did is, is he had the two girls who were like, you know, five weeks and a year and a half old go live with uh, an aunt and uncle for a year or so, just so he could kind of sort things out because he did have this, you know, the banking and things to run. Um, about two years later, he remarried uh, and uh, uh, the woman that he married uh, was a really good stepmother to the girls. So as soon as he married, he brought the girls home, and she just loved them like her own children. And so they had a really close relationship. Um, a couple years later, they had another daughter named Louise, and so there was three girls. They were about, you know, I think there was two years between the older two and then five between the next one. And um, the father, again, they had a lot of money, um, and so he and so they were homeschooled. Um, you know, they had tutors coming in and things like that. It wasn't even like the, the new mom had to teach them. They had tutors coming in. They had the best education they could. And he believed that they should learn geography in an active way. So they would take tours around the United States. Again, this is like in the 1860s, 1870s. Okay, so you can imagine. It's not like hopping in your car and driving down the interstate. You know, they'd hop on a train. And there's even a, a story about, you know, like, like they were stuck on a train once because there was a, a railroad strike. And, you know, like, uh, Native Americans attacked the train. You know, there's, you know, so it's that kind of stuff. It's kind of Wild West kind of stuff. And, um, but anyway, I mean, they were fine in the end, but they would tour around um, and, and see different things. And one of the things that made its mark on Catherine, well, on all the sisters actually, was they noticed the poverty around the country. And again, think about what's going on in the 1860s and 1870s, right? You know, Civil War was 1865, that's when that was done. Um, and so they're going around in like the 1860s, 1870s, slaves had just been freed, you know, they're still fighting Native American wars. So slaves are free. So there's a lot of poor black people that are, you know, moving to different places and things like that. A lot of the Native Americans are living in poverty. And this is one thing that all the daughters noticed. And the thing that you got to know about the dad and the, and the stepmom is that they were very devout Catholics. I mean, the dad spent a ton of time in prayer. And they believed that their money was a gift from God that they needed to share. So they weren't rich and just hoarding it all for themselves. They gave a ton of money to charity. And so this made an impression on the girls as well. Um, and so, but, but they noticed this, and they, but they noticed the parents, the way that they did that. In fact, they would open their home, I think it was on Thursdays, they'd open their home to the poor in Philadelphia on Thursdays, and they would come in and they would serve them and give them what they needed and all that kind of stuff. So it was really, really... Um, solid, you know, solid in their faith, but solid in their, their works of mercy as well. Um, as, as things went along, uh, Catherine gets to be about, I think it was about 20 years old, 21 years old, and it, her stepmother is diagnosed with cancer. 
and um, she spent a lot of time caring for her at that point in time. I mean, it, you know, they didn't have to go out and work. So she was 21. You know, they were, you know, they were still doing arranged marriages at the time. So there was potential for her to have an arranged marriage. But um, she started feeling a call to religious life at this point in time, especially since she was spending so much time with her stepmom and taking care of her in the three years um, before she died. Um, she spent a lot of time with that, and, and around the time that her stepmother died. She, uh, there was a, a, a priest that was her friend who soon became a bishop and she, he was her spiritual director and she, she was like, I really feel a call to religious life. And he told her, he says, he says, it's not time yet, wait and just pray right now. And so being obedient to her spiritual director, she did that. Um, but by the time that her stepmother died, um, she started feeling this call even more and he kept saying, just pray about it and just pray about it. So there was a time in um, the late 1870s, I believe. Um, no, actually it was in the late 1880s. She was about 20, they were late 20s at this point in time. And they were traveling in Europe and uh, Elizabeth, Louise, and Catherine got an audience with Pope Leo XIII. And so we've, you guys have probably heard him before. He was really close to St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, who we talked about a couple times ago. And, and actually, there's a connection between these two saints. Um, that we'll, hopefully, I'll remember to talk about in a minute. Um, but they went before him and, and they said, you know, um, Holy Father, we've seen such poverty in the Americas. We need you to send missionaries to help them. You know, there's, there's a lot of Native Americans. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, black people that are, that are suffering in, in the Americas, and we need you to send missionaries. And Pope Leo, think about what, he, if you remember what he told um, Francis Xavier Cabrini, he said, you know, I want you to be a missionary, but I, I want you to, to go to the Americas rather than to China. He said something kind of similar to um, Catherine Drexel, and he said, he says, how about, how about you be the missionary? Something to that effect. And this really spoke to her heart because she had been feeling this tug to religious life, and she took that as an indication that she should pursue this. And so when she came back, she, she continued to talk to her spiritual director, and, uh, and, and, and Pope Leo XIII had said, I want you to start an order. She wasn't even a religious, but he said, I want you to start an order and do this. And so that's what she took as her calling. And so when she went in to become a nun, she went into the training of a nun with another order, but with the intent of when she was then made a nun that this new order was going to start. And so during that time, she somehow crossed paths with Francis Xavier Cabrini, and she helped her write the rules for the order and talked with her about how she needs to go about it with the Pope, whom she was friends with, and, uh, and helped her get this order off the ground. And so she did. And after a time in the early 1890s, um, they had about 10 nuns, and they, they studied and they prayed and they did uh, that for about three years. And then they sent five of them off to Santa Fe, New Mexico to set up a school for the Native Americans out there. Um, they were also involved in like South Dakota and in Virginia, and they were setting up schools particularly for African Americans and for Native Americans. And they, that's what they really felt their calling to do. So there's lots of pictures of her in schools with a lot of African Americans, these schools that they built for them. And with, with the Native Americans, these, these places they would build specifically for them so they could get an education, so they could get, you know, meals, and they can get medical attention, all this kind of stuff. And she, you know, in the meantime, her father had died, and he left them this fortune, right? And they said, at first when I saw this, it said, he left them $14.4 million. And you, you know, if you and I get that, it'd be like, whoa, that's, that's a lot of money. But I'm like, that's not a fortune. But then it said, in today's money, that would be almost half a billion dollars. Okay, so he left these. Uh, he left the three daughters that much money, and in the meantime, one of the other sisters, she went on her honeymoon and she got really sick. She got pregnant. She got really sick and she died. So there's only two sisters left. There was Louise, who is the youngest, and Catherine. Catherine also married another man who was very much a philanthropist, and he was very, you know, very much of the same vein. And so Catherine and her sister Louise wound up spending a lot of time doing projects like this, even though Louise was married, they spent a lot of time doing this, as did Louise's husband. And so they had a ton of money, and so they just financed all this stuff, right? Then the father wrote it, wrote the, um, his will so that the two girls had total control over the money, because um, he knew that he had raised them well. And so when he died, you know, of that, of that you know, roughly half a billion dollars, 10% right off the top went to charities. He had that all set up, and the rest of it, about $400 million in today's money 
went to the two daughters and they just started funneling it into these projects. They just, they just said, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to build this school. We're going to build this convent. We're going to do all this stuff. And they, they just, it was kind of like, I remember Francis Xavier Cabrini, she built like 67 schools, hospitals, and orphanages. That's what, that's what Catherine Drexler did too. She built like, I don't remember what the number was. It's, it's just something insane when you think about it. It was like 200 different institutions she built, you know, and helped build and helped finance with her money. So she just, you know, she's like, she took from her parents that idea that this money is not mine, it's God's money, and I'm going to do with it, you know, what God wants me to do with it. And, um, and so she did this. Now, in um, 1915, she wound up down in Louisiana, and she decided to start a school, and I don't remember exactly what it was called. It was like, it was the Xavier School, I think is what it was called. Um, after Francis Xavier, and maybe had some influence because of Francis Xavier Cabrini, not sure. Um, but that school became Xavier University, which you guys have heard about. They're really good at basketball and stuff like that. You know, they're always in the in the Sweet 16 and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that was set up as a Catholic college for black men and women. And so that was that's how that started out. That was Catherine Drexel who started that, that became this this major university. And she financed it with the inheritance that she received. And so she just kept doing these projects. And then her order just kept growing exponentially because people saw the good works that they were doing. Um, and so, so, this, so there was a lot of nuns that were teaching at the schools. They were working at the, the orphanages and at all the different things that they were building. So it gets to be in the late 30s and she winds up having a heart attack. Um, and it kind of limited her to what she could do. So she was pretty much limited to staying at the mother house at that point in time. And she lived about another 20 years. She died in 1955 at the age of 96. And so you can imagine with all the money they had, and they still hadn't spent all the money by the time she died. You know, now I'm sure they had some of it tied up in investments and things like that so it could make more money. Um, but, but they just kept doing things with the good fortune that they had received. Um, they didn't keep any from themselves. Um, and so um, she had this incredible devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. The, 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 uh, the, the name of her order was the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, um, uh, the, the fifth luminous mystery is the institution of the Eucharist, right? And so this idea of, of, of Jesus' presence in the Eucharist, and she had this huge devotion. She spent a ton, a ton of time in adoration, and that was a big one of the charisms of, of her order as well is that they spent a lot of time in adoration. And that's probably why they were so fruitful is because they, they were praying about what they were doing and they were realizing it was Jesus's work and not theirs. They were just doing what he was asking them to do. Um, uh, her case for canonization was opened um, maybe in the early 19, I think it was in the early 1980s. I think it was by John Paul II. And in 1988, she was beatified. Um, there was a young, I think it was a young man who was cured of, he had a just serious inner ear damage and it was miraculously cured. Um, her second miracle was in the late 1990s and it was another person that was cured of, of deafness. They were born deaf and then suddenly they could hear through the, her intercession. And so in 2000, the year 2000, John Paul II canonized Catherine Drexel. Like I said, she became only the second American, uh, native born American canonized um, so far. Now there's been more since then. Um, but but it's really important because she had such an impact. And so if you go around the country and you see this name Drexel, D-R-E-X-E-L, um, like I said, you go to Drexel University in Philadelphia. I don't know that was named for her, but it was probably after the family. Um, but if you see that name Drexel, that's that's an indication that that she probably had some influence there. So keep your eye open for that. Um, but she's just she's a real powerhouse saint. Um, and I, I think I can't remember her patronages are. Um, those of philanthropy and of racial, racial justice. And so you think about um, you know, some of the stuff that's going on now. She grew up in a time where there really was racism, right? I mean, this was like when the Jim Crow laws were there and black people were being kept down by society and the Native Americans were being kept down by society. There was real racism then. I mean, some of the stuff they're talking about now is not anywhere near what it was then. Um, this um, uh, sy systemic racism, things like that, existed then. It really doesn't exist that much anymore. I mean, there's racism, but not systemic racism. Then it was inbred in the society and people treated these other, um, these other groups like that. And so she did something active and something positive and something, um, you know, with, with the wealth that she had to fix that. 
And so that's an example to us. We may not have a lot of money to do with it, but we can do things that can actively, you know, make things better for other people. And so, so she's also, you know, that um, patron saint of, of kind of racial, uh, racial justice and social justice. To do is at the end of the day today, guys, this is our last high school class, so I want you to take the workbooks with you. And like I was talking with the middle schoolers about, you know, it's, it's good to have head knowledge and to remember this stuff, but it's also good to have resources where you know you can look stuff up. And so this has got a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. There's a lot more things in here that we didn't cover this year. Um, and so this just keep this as a resource for you, you know, not just about the luminous mysteries, but about, you know, um, the scriptural rosaries that we prayed and just about a lot of different things, you know, about the saints that we looked at, maybe some of the praise and worship music, that kind of stuff. Keep it as a resource that you can access. All right.